Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, I think we shall start the morning session of the last day of the school. And uh, the first speakers of today is Jorge Rueda from Icranet and uh, Ainaf. And okay, Jorge, if you want to share, start to share the slides. Yeah. Yes, okay. Let's see if it works. Can you see it now? Yes. It's the full screen now. Do you see you see also the Zoom um, window here? I mean, on the right part or not? Or you see only the... Yes, we see the full screen of your presentation and the, your, okay. the, the, your, your, um, okay, I hide the, your image. I, I, I minimize the zoom now. Okay, it should be okay now. It's okay now? Yes, yes. it's perfect. Then you see, okay. Okay, you can start, uh, Jorge, and you have uh, 40 minutes. Hey, thank you, Carlos. Um, first of all, thank you for the uh, for uh, having me here um, to speak. Um, let's see. Uh, somehow, I will summarize um, what is the binary-driven hypernova model. Um, summary based on what are the, the building blocks of the of the of this scenario for for the explanation of the long, long gamma ray bars associated with supernovae. And I'll also speak a little bit more uh, about uh, not what we have um, done, but uh, also about a few things that we have still to to do um, in the in the near future. I hope. Um, so uh, uh, let me start with the concept of binary progenitor of long GRBs. Um, we heard yesterday um, a very nice summary by Massimo della Valle. Um, about the um, GRB and supernova 1C properties uh, that point to by, uh, at point to, to a binary progenitor for gamma ray burst. So uh, just to recall you um, that GRBs, the long GRBs are often uh, observed in associations with uh, uh, type 1C supernovae. Um, type 1C supernovae lack hydrogen and helium um, in their spectra. Um, and so it is um, a special class of, of supernova that are thought to form uh, in, a, in core collapse supernova events. Um, core collapse uh, supernova of massive stars um, without helium and without hydrogen layers in the outer, uh, in the, in the outermost part of the star. So of course we have to take into account this into the, into the, um, into the model. But um, I will come to that in a moment. Here, I would like just to recall um, the, the, the beginning of what is the, the, the binary driven hypernova model is based on the induced gravitational collapse concept. Um, it is starting in 2006, actually, you see this uh, picture here on the upper right, um, but it was the first idea presented in, in Marcel Grossman in 2016. This was Marcel Grossman in, in Berlin, Berlin, I think, um, where, Actually, it was the, 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 the opposite concept that we, that uh, the binary hypernova. Uh, so uh, I will ask uh, the, the, the other. Ah, sorry. Ah, okay. okay, so at the time, um, the scenario was actually um, the opposite. It was um, proposed that it was the, well, a GRB event that triggered uh, a supernova event in a binary system. So, uh, because we observe the GRBs in, uh, in a temporal and a spatial coincidence with supernova, we have to explain both events. So there was a GRB event that triggers a supernova event. Um, then in 2012, uh, we actually look uh, for uh, what we thought was a, a more viable scenario also for the binary uh, evolution point of view, that it was actually the opposite. So we it changed it completely and that it was first there is a supernova event and it's the supernova event that triggers what becomes the GRB emission. 
and that's all um that's uh, all this talk is about that uh, about that process how this is a supernova event in a binary system can uh, produce a grb event um the grb observables actually what we observe the grb are um, a series a sequence of, of, of episodes in that are all triggered by this this supernova event in a binary system so um from the stellar evolution uh, point of view, um, astrophysical, generally astrophysical point of view, um, we know that GRBs are, are, are related to the collapse of massive stars. Uh, this is a general idea that comes out, uh, from the GRB energetics and from all the properties of GRB. And this is all, all of us, uh, I think, all the time the entire community is, uh, um, agree with this. Um, that the most massive stars are in binaries, as um, Massimo uh, recalled yesterday. So, uh, as a mass syllogism, <laughs> we just with the, these two premises, uh, we have to conclude that most GRBs must be produced in binaries. I pose, uh, um, um, I don't want to be sharp, so I, I, I put it here most, not all, um, we don't know, but uh, actually, it could be actually that all GRBs are <laughs> produced in binaries. Mm, our first idea uh, was presented about of this scenario was presented in 2012. Um, and the first analytic estimates actually of the viability of this process. And the process is that you have the super binary system of a carbon oxygen star um, in a binary with a neutron, neutron star companion. So a compact star companion in a compact orbit, in tight orbit of a few minutes. And then um, the supernova event, uh, you see here, this was a sketch of that paper. But the supernova event, uh, again, the supernova material that is expelled gets uh, captured by the neutron star companion. Neutron star uh, increases mass, angular momentum, and eventually can reach um, the critical mass for gravitational collapse and uh, form a black hole. And this process, actually, this black hole formation is what triggers all the, the next uh, event, the next uh, episodes, actually, uh, that explain the GRB. Um, but actually, picture is more complex. Um, the neutron star uh, is not <laughs> necessarily reached the, the, the critical mass for gravitational collapse. And anyway, it can uh, um, it leads to um, uh, again to a gamma reverse, but of a different kind. So there are different different phase, different possibilities. I will put into that. Um, so um, I like to start from the binary evolution point of view. Um, this was uh, one of the first uh, ideas, actually. Uh, uh, this is a, a sketch from 2015 paper uh, of the binary evolution um, that uh, we, uh, we have in mind for the formation of, the, of this carbon oxygen star, neutron star binaries uh, that, that for the binary driven hypernode. So, um, and actually, um, we end with, with, the, uh, with the conclusion that uh, but the binary driven hypernova must be a subclass of what is known in the literature as a strip envelope binary. Because um, these uh, Taiwan E, Taiwan C uh, supernovae are thought to be um, formed in the core collapse of helium, carbon oxygen, or wolf rayet stars. And these uh, stars are thought to be, uh, or the most um, accepted, the widely accepted scenario for the formation is that they are in binaries. They are in binaries with a compact star companion that is stripped or helps to be stripped by binary interactions and tidal interactions by the, by the occurrence of common envelope phases during the evolution, um, help to strip uh, the helium and uh, the hydrogen and helium outer layers of the star. So um, this is what actually this binary evolution show that you start with the two binaries um, with masses uh, of the order of 10 or 15 solar masses. Um, then uh, you have the first supernova explosion in the system. Then the, uh, as, as usual, um, the system can enter, enter into an X-ray binary phase where the, this, the, 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 the ordinary star that, is, that didn't explode supernova accretes matter onto the neutron star that was formed in the first supernova event. Then the system can um, uh, can go through common envelope phases, and there, at the end of that of, of, the, of those common envelope phases, the helium and hydrogen layers of the star are expelled. If the system survived to that, 
then you end with a with a helium carbon oxygen or work project star it in a um, binary system with a neutron star containing. Then at the end, you have the second supernova event in the binary life. This is uh, the, the, the supernova uh, of this uh, uh, carbon oxygen star that was left here. And here is where we focused. So the binary driven hypernova model focused on the possible or possible fates uh, of this system here. Second supernova explosion with the neutron star companion. At the, at the time, we put these two possibilities, actually, that you have, and we call them family one and family two. Um, what we do, we know now, this family one is what we call um, the binary driven hypernova of type two, while this family two is what we call the family, the binary driven hypernova of type one. And here, the neutron star form a black hole. In this case, in the, in the, in the type two, the neutron star doesn't reach the critical mass and it just it, is you, you can end with a neutron star, neutron star binary, while in this case, you have a neutron star and black hole. Because from this supernova event, you will form um, a, a neutron star at the center. So uh, we have a variety. Actually, the system can get disrupted, and, uh, and you just uh, the system expel, and you will have two runaway stars. This is another possibility. Um, well, uh, so this uh, um, binary, this is stellar evolution point of view, um, uh, start to, to evolve and actually we made um, um, start to, to make uh, to count uh, so to, to count uh, the GRB systems to make a population um, analysis uh, of the system. This was um, this ends with a paper in 2016 and I put this picture here because this was discussed in BEGO 4 uh, uh, meeting in 2016. You see here from the blackboard you see a discussion of the binary or the population of GRBs uh, BDHN, you see here uh, on the blackboard, uh, discussing how many binary driven hypernova we expected to be observed in uh, to be observed in the GRPs um, GRP observation. We were discussing how to identify them and to 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 estimate the population. Uh, and so this end with this paper where we classify uh, GRPs um, uh, and and we treat all of them, all GRPs, uh, done as GRPs. So short GRBs, uh, I don't speak about GRBs, uh, short GRBs here because they, they is a, are widely accepted um, that they come from mergers of or neutron star of neutron star binaries or neutron star black hole binaries. Um, and uh, the new thing here was the long bars, the long gamma ray bars that uh, were treated as a uh, arise from CO star neutron star binaries and these two possible channels in which this then less energetic uh, than with energy emission that less than 10 to the 52 Rx, uh, where the, 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 this what we call at the time, uh, but this will we call X-ray flashes or low luminosity GRBs, while the energy is larger than 10 to the 52 um, at the high energy GRBs. Um, so in this case, these cases are where before you form a black hole, and in these cases are, those, are those in which you, do, you don't form a black hole, and we estimate from this analysis and all these properties that you hear by looking at the at the uh, and, and the spectrum and the, the possible uh, X-ray emission GB and all of that GB emission. I will come to that uh, uh, to infer a rate. What is the rate? And how many GRBs you observe uh, per per unit volume and per unit time? These estimates are in the in a local universe, so our rate is our rate is zero. Um, as we, that um, Massimo de la Valle was uh, yesterday uh, discussing about that. So uh, we end with similar numbers. Uh, uh, you see here the rate with the rate of high energy GRBs was uh, let's say uh, roughly about one per uh, gigaparsec cube per year, while uh, the low luminosity ones, uh, let's say, uh, to give an order of magnitude, is about hundred uh, gigaparsec cube per year. So they are uh, much more. Um, much, uh, um, much more than the high luminosity. And this is from the BDHN model. This is a, a natural, I will come to that now, right now. So um, I would like to, to, to summarize that from a few numbers. I think we have um, a problem. So uh, uh, yes. let's Yes, yes uh, Jorge, um, sorry. Just to, uh, 
there was a small uh, uh, cut in it's the connection, okay. but now it's okay. If you I can see. start again with this slide, it will be nice. Okay. okay. Can I ask a question uh, or do I have to wait until yes. the end of the... Yes. But I, I would say no, no problem with no problem with me. Okay. Yes, if you can go back to the previous slide, uh, you were showing the uh, yes APKIs so correlation and the classification. Did yes. you try also other correlation, for example, uh, the correlation in the afterglow, my correlation luminosity at the end of plateau? Oh yes. End of plateau. Oh yes, we <laughs> yes we have uh, another paper that in another paper. Uh, I don't have the reference right now, but yes, we tried an, another one after. Uh, also for the for the short um, GRBs, um, yes. But uh, sorry, Maria Joan, I don't remember the reference right now. Ah, okay, <laughs> so maybe maybe yes. If you remember later, it would be nice yes. if you could uh -huh. show. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. okay. Thank okay. you. Thanks. And um, okay, so we want to uh, speak um, to treat here the problem of the binary evolution. I mean, what are the population uh, uh, where um, this uh, uh, CO uh, carbon oxygen neutron star binaries uh, come from. So let's uh, with, compare with the population of ultra strict binaries. So these ultra strict binaries of progenitor of type 1c supernova are thought to be 0.1 and 1% of the total supernova uh, events. The supernova rate, you remember this number from, from the Massimo della Valle talk of yesterday, about 2 times per 10, 10 to the 4 gigaparsec per year. It means that the ultra strip rate would be between 20 and 200. Um, gigaparsec cube per year. Okay, um, these ultra strip uh, binaries are thought to form neutron star neutron star binaries or are disrupted binaries. This was the this is the traditional uh, view of ultra strip binaries. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, this uh, actually there is a subclass of these that can also be more energetic and form neutron star black hole binaries in a by deviation binary given hypernova of type one. So the um, BDH1 rate is one gigaparsec cube per year, and the BDH2 is 100. So you can, uh, the sum, so that will be the entire GRB uh, of uh, supernova ratio is between, it's a very small, so less than 0.5%. Uh, this, this is pretty, I agree with the numbers of uh, 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 Massimo yesterday. So we know GRB so cure there are much less often than supernova. Uh, because they need special conditions uh, to, to, to be formed. The ratio between BDH1 and ultra strip are between 0.1 and 5%. So this confirms that this BDH1, they are a small subset. Uh, this is uh, consistent with uh, the request that to form a BDH1, the binary must be very tight. So you need a short orbital period of the order of a few minutes. I will come to that. Um, and this is a this is this is a, a strong request. So you sh you should expect uh, that this assistance to be uh, to form quite often. Okay. So this is uh, the first message, uh, and this is different from the variation two that are the low luminous GRBs. If you made the ratio with ultra strip, they can be between fifty percent and one hundred percent. You can, cannot be more. But these you know these are there are uncertainties in the in the. In the in the rates, uh, both in the rate of ultra strip binaries, both in the rates of GRB. So we have the uncertainties. But this number, you see the difference between these two numbers, the deviation one, deviation two, um, tells you that actually that deviation two, um, that in the deviation picture, actually they can naturally form neutron star binaries or disrupted binaries, agree with the ultra strip population. Um, and this can be compared also with the short GRB rate now. Why? Because if the BDH1 can form neutron star black hole binaries, the BDH2 can form neutron star neutron star binaries. You, we know that these bi new binaries of compact star objects can merge uh, because of the gravitational wave emission that will make, will make them to, to merge in, in some uh, uh, years. In, in uh, of the order, I will show that, but uh, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 years, something like that. Um, so um, let's compare with the short GRB rate. So short GRB rates are between um, 10 to the minus 3, 5 gigaparsec per year. So we make the, the, the ratio between short GRB, addition 1, you end with 0.1, 500%. So 
it's in, it implies that short GRBs might be dominated by the majors of Newton and Star, Newton and Star, not by the majors of Newton and Star black hole model. And I think that um, these, uh, uh, I think most uh, of the community uh, would agree with that. Uh, in fact, if you make the ratio of short GRB with mediation two, uh, you end uh, with uh, this number, well, about uh, 5%. Um, this uh, can be, have, can have uh, two interpretations. Uh, first, uh, this, this one uh, I, I like most, is this is the fraction of the carbon oxygen neutron star binaries that lead to bound neutron star binaries. So it indicates that not all in not all system will lead to a neutron star neutron star binary I mean a bound binary, but instead you can also have a, a large fraction of of these disrupted binaries. And this is consistent with population synthesis scenarios. I, I cite, uh, I quote here only one paper, but <laughs> there are many actually, in which they have, you see here different, um, a binary evolution scenario is similar to our scenario, uh, in their case, focusing on the formation of double neutron stars. Um, so these uh, numbers are interesting, but we have to move to the, okay, to the simulations. So what are the building blocks of the system of this BDHN from the point of view of, uh, of the episodes of physical episodes and observables in the GRB? So um, evolution, of course, um, we have to move to the, um, uh, this supernova explosion called um, uh, triggering a series of processes. You have to simulate that. This was discussed, uh, for example, this is in the PhD school in 2014, um, Why well, this is important is because uh, we move from the first, start to move from the first analytic estimate, very simple estimates of 2012, to make a more involved uh, models uh, involving uh, numerical simulation, uh, starting from realistic models of supernova. Um, uh, and this actually was uh, boosted by the presence of, uh, or by uh, the um, addition of Chris Fryer, that is here in this picture you see here. Next to you, Carlos, you see here is a, a Chris Fryer next to you. I recognize that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and then we start to actually, um, Chris Fryer, uh, I think here, uh, I always want to remember that he changed his mind on the IGC Council in the say that he was actually um, trying to show that this mechanism couldn't work. So he was trying to, to show that from uh, to taking a supernova explosion and putting a neutron star companion, the system, I mean, that you could never get uh, critical mass. But when he started to make his own simulation, he um, uh, realized that actually this was, uh, 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 this was one of the possible outcomes of his uh, simulations. So we start to move from that. And actually, this was the, the beginning of this paper. So this was the first simulation with a, a realistic supernova explosion. Um, but this was in 1D, um, the 1D simulation. Um, you can see here the results of the numerical uh, accretion uh, onto the Newton star companion. So this is, uh, uh, is um, from the Cork from the Corcola supernova code of Los Alamos. Um, I'm making uh, some. Uh, this was the first step. Uh, farther with respect to the 2012 paper, but what uh, still has some uh, approximations in the in the in the calculation of the accretion rate, in the calculation of the uh, in a few 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 things, but also already includes um, uh, hydrodynamics of the of the accreting material onto the neutron star that you can see here in this sketch on the on the on the left side. It was a fifth step, and, and, and it was actually shown that the accretion rate could be pretty high at the order of 10 to minus 2 solar masses per second. And uh, this means that the neutron star can indeed, in, in, in the time of an orbit, roughly, in the time of an orbit, could uh, get enough material to reach the critical mass to form a black hole. Then uh, we move uh, to um, 2015. Um, we, we went one step further and put effects of, uh, of, of um, uh, angular momentum transfer that in this pre previous simulation, we didn't uh, take into account with, uh, uh, th that effect. Um, you can see here some uh, new simulations of the, this, uh, gray, uh, this gray point where the neutron star uh, moving 
um, around this exploding material that are the red uh, arrows. Um, the arrows are velocity fields. And um, you see the plot on the left, you can see the neutron star mass increasing, uh, the neutron star increasing both mass and angular momentum. So moving, these are evolution paths of the neutron star moving into the, into the stability plane and eventually reach, can, was um, um, able to reach um, either mass shedding, so the Keplerian limit or secular axisymmetric instability, so the kinetic prompt collapse to a black hole. Um, was then uh, we show actually that for the most compact binaries, uh, they uh, actually don't only form a black hole, but that they can keep a bound. Uh, Laura um, mentioned that in her talk yesterday afternoon. Um, and so actually this, uh, but uh, BDHN1, type one, which you form a black hole actually most likely um, keep a bound as a neutron star black hole binary. We estimate the merger time. Uh, this was the, actually a merger time for, for that short year. Um, that we actually call the ultra short year. Um, well, this is some results, but then we move because we have to move to more involved simulations because there were, um, mm, there were still some approximations in the treatment. And this was discussed in this meeting in 2016 in uh, Pescara. And this is his flyer here, his flyer um, uh, standing in the wall of the of Pescara uh, headquarters. Um, and we started to discuss a possible inclusion of three-dimensional three dimensional simulations uh, in the, the in this this um, uh, into this model um, it was a very successful uh, uh, discussion and actually um, uh, we were discussing writing actually the first lines of the new numerical code to do that thanks to you see this guy here on the left uh, uh, with glasses this is uh, Brandon Wiggins that also helped us in 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 introducing these fears um, uh, boost to the code, but, act, but then he, he left the project because he, that he, he told us he was very involved in his uh, actually uh, was uh, writing a new code for, for mergers of double white dwarfs. Uh, and so he, he didn't have the time to, uh, to get involved into this project too. Uh, but uh, anyway, we managed to do that with Laura that moved to Los Alamos and, and then there'll be a new um, for one year and, and by the, with the help of Chris and, and uh, other students, the new code um, and to do this kind of thing. So these are three-dimensional simulations uh, of the, this, uh, the binary system. You see the two stars now. Here, both the stars, you see vortices of accreting material. What are these two stars? It was the exploding star in the binary, and this is the neutron star companion at the center of the supernova you form the newborn neutron star. And you have both of them accreting. So this newborn neutron star gets material from fallback while the neutron star companion most, gets it more naturally, let's say. It receives the matter from the companion. I well, simulated that, um, including the hydrodynamics effects um, on, on both stars and get the, um, the accretion rates on both of them. And, and also the transfer from mass angular momentum and, and, and follow the evolution. This is a three-dimensional picture uh, where you see the, this, uh, this uh, important effect that is the asymmetry that is formed into the, sup into the supernova ejecta around the system, creating even a sum of, of low density around the neutron star companion. So uh, you, you form a lot of what we call the cavity, uh, around the, the where the site of the, will be the site of the black hole or the black hole formation around it there is a a, a large um, a region uh, that is like a hole uh, I mean a very uh, a region of very low material very low density matter uh, material so they have a variety of initial conditions that can be exploited uh, uh, for the explanation of uh, gamma ray bars. Uh, and and uh, I, we have uh, we haven't do that, but to now I think that we can exploit more. Um, it's a variety of examples. This is the accretion rate onto the neutron star companion for um, a variety of scenarios. You see in the first plot, you see different orbital periods here uh, in the upper left, in the upper right. You see um, different uh, different initial neutron star masses on the lower left. 
these are axi uh, even uh, axi um, um, asymmetric supernova explosions that uh, actually Massimo mentioned yesterday is actually a, a very important ingredient that perhaps we should um, take into account more in our analysis. Um, the possibility of asymmetric supernova explosions is uh, actually we did some simulations of that um, in paper of 2019. Um, on the lower right, you see different progenitor masses. So the masses of the carbon oxygen star that explodes as supernova can be can have different mass, can have different density profile. And this leads to a different fate of the system. And uh, well, it's not shown here, but we did it. Um, we explored different supernova explosion energies from 0.1 to 10 fold, I mean, uh, 10 to the 50 to 10 to the 52 error uh, of energy of supernova explosion. Uh, we have now a new study um, that uh, Laura showed yesterday, uh, also including non-zero initial neutron star angular momentum. So not only uh, different possible masses, but also different uh, neutron star angular momentum. So uh, in all the simulations of 2019, we always started with non-rotating stars, but this is um, um, this is not necessarily the case. Uh, so, and there are differences if you start with a non-zero angular moment. This is a, a, a plot of the new numerical simulations uh, in, with increase uh, uh, increased resolution. Um, and again, you see the at the end the new the two both stars accreting uh, material and to and one of them get getting the critical mass to get the the, the, the to be for, for a black hole that was the neutron star companion not the new world neutron star. So these are uh, the new studies and results. The new studies these are the accretion rates. On the left, you see this is the fallback onto the new born neutron star. Uh, while in the right, on the right plot, you see the accretion rate onto the neutron star companion. This is for different orbital periods. Uh, you see the different outcomes. And you see this very unique feature of the binary of the BDHN. The second peak of supernova accretion onto the neutron star, onto the newborn neutron star. This is a, a unique feature. If you have a neutron star, the newborn neutron star in a supernova accreting material by fallback, usually what you get is a power law, accretion rate that, fall, that follows this power law, or always a power law, okay? But when you have the presence of the binary companion, actually it takes a, some a matter that would escape and keep it bound to the system and eventually this can get, uh, can get, can get captured by the can be captured by the neutron star by the newborn neutron star and form the second peak of fallback accretion. And actually, this is an important point. Um, we're simulating a spin up on a spin down phases of this, these stars while accreting by the torque of accretion by the torque of uh, of uh, by the spin down due to the magnetic stresses by uh, by a dipole and quadrupole magnetic field. And while we are managing to be to have a, a semi-analytic uh, treatment of this, even if this is full general relativity uh, uh, result uh, of this, this is on the right. You see different uh, evolution of the rotation period as a function of time. You see the spin up phase, and then you see the spin down phase of the both the newborn neutron star uh, on the left and the right. You see the neutron star companion. This is a new uh, new paper actually. Well, um, this is the evolution of, uh, of the change of the gain of uh, energy of both the stars. And you see this uh, different, uh, this complex structure of these different peaks of uh, energy gains of this uh, uh, of the system. And actually, um, this is uh, uh, very interesting because um, we expect this uh, double peak structure. You can see these two main peaks. Uh, these uh, two, you see the colors are for the neutron star companion, while the black are for the newborn neutron star. And what you see, you could see in a GRB, these the two main peaks, two, the two higher, higher intensity peaks, one of the neutron star companion and the other one of the, of the newborn neutron star as a precursors. Uh, a precursors in a main G, in a high energy GRB or as a double peak plum emission of a low luminosity GRB. So, and actually this was shown in, uh, in our recent analysis of 1908-29A, I suppose I, uh, you one uh, will speak about that in a, in, in a moment. So I don't want to spoil this uh, more, um, but you actually you have this double peak structure in the prompt of 1908-29A that we 
uh, for which we make an interpretation based on those two peaks that I showed you before and infer the accretion rate, infer the gate if angular momentum and show how energy it can be released and actually that much what is observed. And uh, this is also, this is another example if we take even more wide binaries on even only a single star. If the binary is very wide or, or if, the, if the CO core is the CO star is, a, a, is single, you don't have very much differences in the behavior of the neutron star, of the newborn neutron star. And uh, actually, this uh, is shown in this analysis of 171205A. This is a GRB uh, discussed by, by Luca Itzo yesterday. So we have a, a picture, an ongoing um, analysis of that, of, of that. I don't know if you will talk about that, <laughs> maybe not. But just to show you here that also in that case, uh, even we managed to make um, a, a fully analytic, uh, full analytic analysis of the spin-up phase of the newborn Newton star. Uh, in that case, you see here the analytic and the numerical integration, you know, maybe um, uh, almost overlapping the two uh, or analytic solution uh, for that. Jorge, uh, you have uh, three more minutes and then to have some questions. Okay. So the Newton star gravitational collapse, I already mentioned that you can get the, the instability for the gravitational collapse. And so we have, you can divide, you have system in which collapse then for the neutron, the black hole in system which you don't for the black hole. This is an old plot that we are updating now with Laura. Uh, this is an ongoing work on updating uh, where is the orbital period, the maximum orbital period of the system which you form a black hole that depends on a variety of parameters. And we are trying to explore more, most of them and form and, 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 and will be, uh, will inform to all of you that uh, about those results in, uh, in, in a forthcoming paper. Uh, we have, of course, analysis of X-ray and gamma ray flares in the GRBs. Uh, you have the formation of the electron positron plasma in the black hole formation. That was the talk of uh, Rahim Moradi yesterday. But this is this um, Rahim is, uh, spoke yesterday about the expansion of the electron positron plasma in the low density region. But you have also this plasma expand also in, 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 the, in the high density region also. You see here the hole I was mentioning, this cavity. So you have here along this, uh, this part, you have the low density, but you have also high density on the borders. And there you can see um, the breakout of this electron positron plasma, the transparency along these regions can be observed as X-ray or gamma ray flares. Uh, the UPE, this is, I jump because he's, this is uh, Rahim yesterday. Uh, so you have the, you, the, the ultra relativistic from emission from the black hole formation, but you have also the high energy emission. The high energy emission is uh, uh, when the neutron star collapses uh, to the black collapse to a black hole, the black hole gets immersed into the, is, uh, into the magnetic field that the magnetic field, previous magnetic field of the, of the neutron star enhanced by the conservation of magnetic flux. Uh, uh, and then this, uh, um, this uh, combination of the, of the magnetic field with the gravitomagnetic field of the curve, new, newborn curve black hole induces an electric field. And this electric field is able to, um, in the first part uh, in the, for the UPE phase, it gets it at the beginning uh, supercritical and get, make the formation of electron positron pairs that the self accelerate, span, get transparency, and make these the, the pulses that show that uh, Rahim showed yesterday. Then, it, the, as the magnetic field, as the magnetic field decay by a screening process of the electron positron pairs, the magnetic field, the electric, field, the induced electric field eventually gets under critical. Okay, and then when it uh, when hap what happens is an uh, uh, process of acceleration of particles, of uh, the particles around the black hole and emits a synchrotron radiation. I will jump some details here. Uh, what you have here some from regions, um, uh, regions where the electric field is uh, outward and other regions with the electric field inward. So what we would, li what I would like to have is in this region uh, accelerating electrons and these electrons get uh, a sync emits a synchrotron radiation that actually in the jet region. I show here, and this comes at the expenses of the black hole rotational energy. So everything is powered by the black hole rotational energy. So both the UP phase and the GV emission. So it comes from the extraction of rotational energy of the black hole. Um, 
So in, in every in, in this in this uh, process of acceleration, so what is taken out is the rotational energy. So as soon as the, you see this energy gets is get radiated, what you I will jump these details of these are all details of the, our recent paper with uh, Professor Rufin and Roy Kerr uh, of the, this acceleration of particles in this gravitomagnetic field of the black hole and get synchrotron radiation. But if we go to the to the to the process here, I will jump to this here, <clears throat> uh, and you have this, uh, this process that bit by bit reduces the rotational energy uh, of the black hole. And you have here this, uh, uh, Professor Ruffini mentioned this yesterday, the discussion of yesterday afternoon, this mechanism can be uh, applies both to GRBs and also to uh, tigalactic nuclei. The only thing that you have to, to do is to scale the mass and the black hole and the density of the ambient medium. And you get different numbers that match uh, uh, either GRB high energy emission or IGN high energy emission. Well, this is the just uh, uh, this, and I would like to end with the afterglow. Give me please uh, just to show you uh, in a few uh, just uh, we'll uh, jump to the concept and the synchrotron, the multi wavelength afterglow. I mean, X ray optical radio emission of the afterglow is synchrotron emission of the expanding supernova in the magnetized medium of the newborn neutron star. And so you get the uh, energy, uh, the electrons in the eject emitting synchrotron radiation, and, and the newborn neutron star also injects energy into this. Um, we have a, a, an analytic treatment of that actually, in a, in a, that you can look, see in these papers here. And actually, you have the cases on some feats of here of the uh, 180720B or the feat of 190829A. I think when you will show that. So I just had you here highlighting that. And I will jump this of gravitational wave emission. These are new results that will be useful for population synthesis. Laura showed this yesterday. We are analyzing well the, the, the binaries that get bound, bound, bound that uh, binaries that get unbound and making some analytic formulas for the analysis, for their analysis, merger time, final binding energy, maximum orbital period, and this kind of things. Uh, and then this has outcomes in gravitational wave, um, in the possible gravitational wave emission. We have analyzed possible gravitational wave emission also from the transition from the early, very early life of the newborn Newton star, if it gets initially triaxial, and then uh, 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 make a transition from antriaxiality to axis symmetry. And in this early, very early evolution, it uh, can uh, make a gravitational wave bars that, that can be um, observed more or less uh, following or estimates up to 100 megaparsec distance. And then uh, we see a conclusion, <laughs> a series of papers. Um, uh, the picture the Massimo showed it yesterday is a summary picture of what is happening in these binaries. And there are, this is a not, not all papers, but a comprehensive list of the, of the um, papers uh, um, about the uh, theoretical, theoretical developments of, uh, in, in, the, in all these um, uh, summary that I tried to, <laughs> to make in, in, in this uh, talk. There are things to do. This is a list that uh, you can read. This is, uh, this is a personal list, okay? This is my personal view of a few things that, that, can, be, that can be done in the, in the short, medium, and long term. So I will um, leave it for, for you. Thank you, Carlos. I'm sorry for the, for the, the uh, it's okay. extra minutes. Uh, thank you, Jorge, very much for this talk. And I think uh, amazing job you have done in all these years, uh, huge work and development. It was very nice to recall all of, all of this. And uh, well, I now that we have uh, question, uh, time for a couple of questions, uh, you can raise hands or just uh, well, turn on your mic. Well, absolutely uh, unique, this presentation uh, in its historical development, but all the way to the latest uh, uh, interest which will be continued in the next talk. And um, I think we have to make an effort to transmit all this doc document uh, also in written form, because uh, now that we have made this uh, effort in understanding the system, uh, as you said before, you, uh, yesterday, 
we have not to be uh, we have to be uh, open to explain to everyone and uh, this will be a major effort but now the the building blocks are older and uh, the the presentation will be much easier congratulations again and i enjoyed every second of your presentation thank you okay, thank, uh, thank you i agree i fully agree with you uh, we have to do that <laughs> absolutely uh, we made um well we wrote in the last year at last three years um we have two two or three uh, uh short um uh, reviews of uh, of the model that can be that can work as um as a um, base for what we can do but uh but uh, definitely we have to do more uh, in in that direction thank you uh, may I have a question yes. Rahim, go ahead uh, thank you Jorge, for this nice and informative talk i really enjoy I have two specific questions. Hmm. One about the new neutron star, yes. not the companion. What happened that it has in the accretion? It has two p. And the second question Sorry, is: excuse, it, excuse me, I didn't understand. Can you repeat, please? The, the, what the, happened uh, that instead of uh, one peak, it has two peak, and that uh -huh. late power law will go to another peak? And the second question is that: is there any possibility that this neutron star goes to the black hole formation. Okay, uh, thank you, Rahim, for the, this interesting question, because um, the answer for the first is that uh, 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 I mentioned um, is a unique uh, feature of the binary. What happened? Imagine when you have the single uh, star uh, without binary, okay? Forget about the companion. You have a single star uh, core collapse, okay? You form the yes. neutron star at the center. Then there is a, the, the rest of the matter try to escape from the system, okay? The system, that's the matter that will observe a supernova, um, make the supernova. But there is part of the matter that falls into the gravitational, uh, make the fallback, okay? Yes. This, okay, you have the single fallback. In that case, you have a, a power law of the accretion rate decreasing with time in that kind of configuration, okay? The rest of the matter can freely escape. What happened when you put the neutron star companion? You put the neutron star companion, part of the matter of the supernova that would, uh, that would escape actually fall into the gravitational field of the companion, okay? So that material cannot escape and gets bound into the binary. And what happened actually is that some of these particles get into the gravitational field of the of the companion, make a make a, a sort of a loop around it, and when they come back, get get captured by the neutron star, by the newborn neutron star. Okay, nice. and all those particles that actually otherwise would escape that form that second peak of accretion, right, okay, on the on the newborn neutron star. And actually, <laughs> this is very interesting, your second question, because this is related that in some simulations, we found that actually also the newborn Newton star could uh, 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 reach the critical mass and form a black hole because of this second bump of accretion can make it to gain additional mass and eventually be formed uh, a black hole. But there are very, very, very special cases in which we found that, but we found them. Yeah, and this uh, and this can have some specific observational effect that uh, you can predict. It would be interesting. Ah, uh, yes, that could could be done. Uh, we didn't do that yet, but that nice. that can can be done actually. Um, this <laughs> would would form a binary system of two stellar mass black holes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question. Okay. Maria Giovanna, maybe you have a, you had a question. Oh, 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 many questions. <laughs> yes, Maria did a, a question before. Yes. I think was uh, uh, yes. I ha I have to look to that reference to Shomari Ivanov analysis with the other um, using the the, the additional um, different. Um, these planes of EPIC AI. So uh, and we analyze that also with the luminosity of the plateau, actually. 
Um, okay. If we have that in another in another paper, uh, we we'll, we'll send we we'll send it to to Maria Giovanna. So. Good. Good. Okay. Uh, so if not, we really thank Jorge again for this talk, and we shall move to the next talk, which you, is uh, Yang Li. I stop my uh, sharing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Yang Li, if you can start to share your screen. Okay. Let me try. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> this time is a success. Okay. Good. So you can start. We have Yan Li from Econet. Uh, he will talk about the seven seals of the binary driven hypernova birth. Okay, thanks uh, for the uh, introduce. Okay, I'm going to talk about the seven seals of the PDH in post. Is uh, introduce a, a lot of information uh, in the for the PDH uh, models by the in the first uh, talks by Professor Auger, we we know that uh, there are a lot there are several uh, different process, physical processes predicted by the PDH models. Uh, usually, we can say that the different pro physics process might have a different uh, temporal and uh, and uh, spectral property in the observations. This is this is the left picture showed that uh, show a cartoon picture showed that uh, the um, how a PDH post works uh, under the framework work of framework of the PDH models. So why PDH model? There are at least two significant advantages. The PDH models is based on a binary system, star system. This is a uh, binary star system is common observ observations as compared to single star system. The second reason is that BDH GRB's uh, model can be uh, literally experienced associated with the supernova explosion. So my talk today related to uh, several uh, projects in our team, uh, part of published, the pub, uh, some others uh, has, have not published yet. So the general approach uh, for the data analysis, especially in, uh, for the spectral analysis, uh, we used is uh, the basin plus monocolor marker method uh, used the package, namely 3ML. This package is developed by the FEMI team a few years ago. Uh, when we, we perform a basin analysis, we should see the prior information. The PR information we use the typical value from the FEMI observations. For the more detailed information, you can you can find in these papers. So we starting uh, our research on uh, on this post, uh, lighting one fourteen C. The first was uh, detected by FEMI with a TAV with a TAV emission. Also, we have low low. Uh, uh, a BDH GRB is uh, um, predicted by the BDH model should uh, including uh, these uh, components, uh, component, components. The first is the UPE, uh, UPE phase uh, related to the formulation of black hole. Then follow a Lulogen star rise. Then follow the uh, uh, UPE2 phase, we call the main UPE phase, then the cavity. Later, the hard and x ray, uh, soft x ray flares. At a later time, we maybe observe a uh, GRB and the supernova associated emission uh, in the optical band. Then, we also might be observe the uh, multiple nuns afterglow emission, like sub tower afterglow emission, gel afterglow emission, x ray afterglow emission. This is the picture show the uh, lighting 114C, we including. Uh, we observe, already observed this uh, uh, episodes or, com or we call com com components. We uh, uh, initially we observed the UPE one phase, 
this phase we the the, <clears throat> the spectral we can fit in best fitting uh can be best fitting by a uh, uh, cut polo plus a servo a, a black body component. Then we later we we observe the little sunrise the spectral can be fitting only by cut polo model. Then the UP two phase. The similar to UP1 phase, we also find a thermal component. Then follow the cavity. Then at the late time, we also uh, find a, a, a GRB, uh, GRB uh, a super low associated emission bump at around uh, two weeks. And also, we observe the, 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 the sub tower after the emission and the gel after the emission and the x-ray after the emission. This force is uh, very close. The, the redshift is uh, 0 0.4, and uh, the, light, the duration correct to the uh, rest of frame is 81 seconds. Then, also because the, we found that the UPE 2 phase is very bright, then we try to uh, perform a detailed time resolution uh, analysis. We, 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 we perform a five success, uh, successful uh, iterations. For each iteration, we go uh, uh, short, time, short and short time scale and look deeply and deeply to look the spectral characteristic of the, uh, of the UPE two phase. Then we found a same similarity uh, structure, namely the spectral similar uh, Perform the sim similar behavior. We summarize uh, our plots, put out our plot to guide in this figure and uh, summarize all our, our the, our the information of the fitting result in the table and including all the uh, fitting parameters. We find the temperature, even the uh, cutoff energy, and uh, similar between the uh, uh, different uh, uh, time, time, uh, time scale of the attention file. Then we this we we also <clears throat> look in the another uh, boss uh, eighteen oh seven twenty two B. This is another boss uh, with type of, uh, emission. We also observed the all here the all the uh, seven episodes. Uh, similar to the lighting 146, we also found the UPE1 and the new emissions rise and the UPE2, then cavity and the, also the hard X, soft X flare. And uh, we also. Uh, sorry, uh, Lian Li, I think we have a, a connection break. If you can. Let's wait some seconds if we can restart. I think we are okay now. So can you repeat from the last minute, please? Okay, sorry. Okay. Is this from this is great? <clears throat> this is uh, yes. this is another boss uh, with time emission, like 18 or seven twenty B. We observed all the EBSOs in, in this post. This was also very uh, close to, very close by uh, with the ratio of the 0 0.6. The lighting duration in the rest of the is the lighting, uh, lighting uh, 29, 29 seconds. We, we similar to lighting 143, we observed the, the UPE1 phase, the neutral star rise, and the UPE2 phase, then the cavity, X-ray uh, harder and soft X-ray flare. We also observed the uh, after uh, multi-wave lines uh, after the emission, like the sub type em uh, emission after the low and uh, X-ray after the and uh, tab uh, and the gel after the emission for this post. So we also similar we also performed the um, the five iterations uh, for the UPE two phase for this post because. The UV2 phase is also very bright, similar to the lighting 143. Then we found also found a similarity in, uh, 
structure for the uh, spectral imbalance. And to summarize our, our information in this table. So it, it was, it is interesting. This is the first pause um, uh, that this detected by film in these years. Uh, we missing a lot of uh, uh, component. Uh, the the red the this post have has a, a very high redshift with uh, uh, with uh, uh, redshift is equal to the four point six and the duration correct to the rest of is twenty two second. We we missing we missing the UP one and the UP two phase and cavity hard and X ray. Uh, Flares also we miss the GRB subblower association emission also time after the we this is the uh, uh, the spectral for the this two spark we we didn't find the thermal component so that's why that's why we miss the UPE phase, uh, UPE phase so we also compare to the, our result we also looking the another very interesting was the the O line of four twenty three this this was with with the highest uh, <coughs> redshift and the T lighting is very uh, the duration is very uh, is only the zero point uh, is less than one second we nearly missing all the component we only observe the the neutron rise and the extra afterglow so this is our G saying uh, Result uh, published our uh, our result on the GSIN. We we uh, we found that the twenty two one one a. We found that this can be identified uh, the BD BD one uh, class. We also found another uh, K uh, post. This post also can identify BD uh, type one a uh, BD one or post. Class, but my conclusion is to find seven different components in the BDN tree. One GRB is such as the lighting of 40C and the GRB 18 or something B, and the 22 a and the OLA of 423. And the the further the distance, the free the EB source are observed. This observ observation can be well explained but with the framework of the BDN model. Thanks. And uh, finally, I wanted to <laughs> say something about my, I'm very enjoying with the collaboration with, with the professor, Dolati Maria. We have a, a step, especially a lot of deeply collaborated with each other. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you, Nandi. Um, okay, we have time for the different the, the comments and questions, so. Well, maybe you can show again uh, the GCN which started uh, all this process. Okay. Yes. And uh, and certainly, one uh, the starting point was the twenty two zero one zero one here represented in red as the most powerful. Uh, X-ray afterglow of uh, all the other BDHN1, which we had uh, studied before, in particular in 1901-14C. And, uh, and then we were uh, challenged to look uh, also to the farthest possible BDHN1, which was discovered in our group by Luca Izzo. And um, this led us to the very, uh, of course, very intense um, analysis of the characteristic seals. Maybe we can have, uh, again, the the, 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 the summary of the different sources that you have just shown, the summary table with the red part, yes, yes. And uh, we have seen the transition 
as a function of z. And uh, one of the very interesting point is that the T90, the duration of the signal changes very much with time. Did you show the T90 of yes, each yes. one of them? Yes, for example, this yes. one showed this one here. Up, up there. Yes. Up, Therefore, up. Uh, if you compare the GRB uh, 20, uh, for 1901-14C, for 1901-14C. Yes, 1901-14C is here, here. Yes. 1901-14C is the... The T90 is uh, 81.4 second. Mm. Then uh, if you go to the next one, uh, this one. To the next one, 18.0720B, the T90 ah. is uh, 29.5, but the, the uh, simply because that source is less intense than the previous one. Mm. And then if you move to the most interesting one, the one which changes uh, with Z, uh, you find that the T90 go down to 20 to 8, uh, 86 seconds. And finally, if you go to the last one, the T90 is 0 0.8 second. And uh, this uh, behavior was uh, really predicted uh, by Vipretrosian and collaborator to occur, but here we give the physical reason why this happens. And it's not possible to understand the system just by a single star model, which is traditionally adopted in the collapsar model. But uh, the, all the seven seals which characterize a, a, a BDHN1 are needed to be identified. And this needs a binary system, a binary system form, like uh, Orge used to say, by the CO core and the companion neutron star and the new neutron star born in the, in the, in the process of the supernova event. And uh, all this explain the seven seals. But uh, what is very interesting is that the number of seals changes with the distance. And this is the key point of your table. Can we see again the table? <coughs> yes, maybe you can scroll from one to the next, going from 1807 to 19 to 21. And uh, yes, and, and to show how the number of uh, seals changes and uh, at the same time and at the same time uh, the lifetime the t90 also changes well you did uh, an enormous amount of work uh, let's go back to your paper of 2020 in the spectral analysis study and um, and uh, and we are grateful for you of this uh, immense work that you did in spectral analysis, which finally is leading to a much deeper understanding of uh, uh, BDHN1 as a function of Z. It's not trivial. It is like if nature would like to uh, not allow uh, to learn about the approach of uh, the GRB to the, uh, to the cosmological singularity. And uh, at the same time, the very, very exciting point is that the seven seals have been understood and uh, the situation is not so hopeless in the sense that um, it's true that we cannot find the seals for Z larger than one, 
but we have learned the machine, uh, which is uh, uh, at the background of the BDHN1 at this smaller than one. And this sort of physics, which is the UP phase, this is the crucial point, the self-repetitive process going on on very short time scale down to 10 minus nine second in the UP phase uh, can be scaled like uh, Orge just said previously to the case of very large black hole of 10 to the uh, 10 solar masses like in M87. And the characteristic scale, which is 10 minus nine here in the UP phase becomes of the order of uh, 10 minutes, 10, uh, 10 seconds or longer. And uh, this is very exciting. We are learning for the first time the physics of black holes, thanks to PDHN1, and we will be able to extrapolate to active galactic nuclei all this uh, physics. And clearly, the Z dependence of this result is very important. I just wanted to make this general comment. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. May I yeah. make a quick uh, comment also on this? Uh, yes, Carlos? Jorge. Yes, please, Jorge. Um, okay. Uh, okay. First of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, Lian Lee. This is a um, uh, really, really nice job you have made with this. Um, thank you. Um, and of course, the fact that we are um, confirming actually our picture to very like redshift. Um, this means that we at some point we have to to attack this problem, and that's why I I. I spent some minutes today also speaking about the, the binary stellar evolution um, that we expect for, for our binaries, because the fact that we are confirming the presence of them at very light redshift um, will um, actually say something about uh, the binary evolution at very high redshift, because we need to form our binary. The binary have need the time to evolve and to form the compact the, the compact binary of uh, the CO star or helium star or world ray star in, in binary system with the neutron star companion. So um, actually, uh, it's a really nice problem to to attack from the binary stellar evolution point of view. So the formation of these binaries at very light redshift. So as, um, this is uh, my comment on this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. We have time for more questions. Let's see, we have some other question. Yes. I, ha I have a, I have a, a general question, maybe a bit technical question for Liang Li. So okay. I, um, I'm not uh, uh, from this uh, area of research, but I would like to know this, when you show uh, in the beginning, the Monte Carlo uh, approach you were using to fit all these different features. So the question is, how many free parameters you have uh, or you are using to fit all these yeah. different... This depend on which model you use. For example, if you use the band, band function, you, there are only uh, four parameters. If you use the color power, there are three. If you use the band, color power plus breakboard, there are five parameters. This depends on which model you use. I see, I see but um, could you comment uh, yes but on the free how relation how is the relation between the free parameters and the underlying physics of of your of your oh, this features? is we use the uh, uh, statistical limiting the how uh, here the, the the some statistical limiting the dic uh so okay some statistical like here i see is something like this uh, dic how to say this i forgot the full name so use some statistical to the check inference the inference food. criteria. This is consi this statistical uh, information is consistent uh, consider the the free parameters. We understand. Yes, I know. Uh, you, you are saying that this inference criterion differentiate between the different models which have different amount of parameters. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, but uh, the free parameters, so you can directly relate relate with the, um, 
with a different physical process, you, you are considering these first seconds? Or, 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 or yeah, yeah, yes, you, usually, we, usually we think the, the UP phase, we should uh, include in a thermal component, uh, like, uh, uh, yes, the different physicals, different physicals. We, we think we can, we, yes, and you, for the religious arrest, we, we only, uh, we, we, the spectrum is different uh, because they, we, we didn't observe a thermal component. For the UP2 phase, we, we observe the thermal component. For the cavity, is, is, we also did find a thermal component. Namely, is the initial, we found a thermal component, also we found a line thermal emission component. Then the, the neutron the rest, we only, we only observe the line thermal emissions. Then we, we found a UP2 phase, also a thermal component, then, then disappeared, something like this. The different, uh, yes, different uh, emission component different relate to the different physicals, different yes. physicals of the mechanism. I see. And one more question. And considering you ran a Monte Carlo, so you have an island of probabilities. So you, you, you find some degeneracy among these parameters between uh, for, for given, let's say, uh, uh, observable, or, or you have quite uh, well resolved uh, uh, I mean, quite uh, well, uh, means and uh, and the probability without degeneracy. Uh, sorry, I don't know why can hear your questions again. Okay. <laughs> okay, no, because Monte Carlo sometimes allows you yeah, to yes. understand. Monte Carlo only is the fun of the po uh, post area. Ah. Uh, yeah, this is nothing to do with the uh, how to say with the uh, yes. This Monte Carlo is means fun of the post area. The, the uh, density of the posterior. Then we look the the uh, most probability area to uh, uh, to to assume this area the will, is our best uh, parameter uh, values. We choose. Do you understand? Yes. Uh, yes. 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 How, how to say? <laughs> how to? <laughs> I understand. I understand. So I just want to. And the final, my final question is the following. Could you, could you run, for example, compare the, this approach you have will allow to compare with a different model for yeah. the interpretation of the data and compare between okay, okay. the different yeah, posteriors? Yeah, okay, it's not a different model, it's a different uh, uh, approach. Like we use the basin, there are also transition approach, namely the frequency. Yes, but I, I want to know if, for example, you can compare with other paradigm for interpretation of the data in order to compare, for example, yes. uh, to show this the comparison but with the same algorithm. Yes, of course, you can compare, you must compare, mm. in the sense that in order to fit the seven seals, you need absolutely a binary nature of the system which has different physical component, which we have identified by their spectra, namely the UPE. And uh, each one of these has a significance and identify the source. But you cannot fit any one of this data with an object, for example, which is calling from a collapser and a single ultra relativistic jet. There is no way to fit the, in that way. Therefore, the answer is yes. We have now very detailed description of the system of the binary and different component, the CO core, the neutron star, and the companion neutron star, and all this detail. And thanks to the spectral analysis, which has been done by Liang Li in our group, it can be completely defined. But certainly, it's alternative to the other point of view, which cannot fit the data. And But I would like to uh, um, uh, maybe Orga's comment. Yes, uh, Jorge, want to comment, please, Jorge? Oh, thank yes. You. Yes, thank you. Um, Okay, yes, I have a question because in one of these seals, I don't I see a um, GRB supernova connection. Uh, I want to ask you if this, uh, you refer to the su optical supernova uh, uh, to that part, I suppose. 
Um, so I want to ask you if about the optical supernova of the optical counterpart of the uh, afterglow um, concerning uh, that, uh, if you expect some change with the, from the James Webb telescope, or did you expect the James Webb telescope would put a, a cross there of a, a, a yes into that, maybe to observe some of these systems at high redshift? Okay. I, uh, I would like to touch on the same topic. Uh, but this is really uh, 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 very exciting. If you look, uh, uh, Orge has pointed out something very crucial, that we know that the binary system evolve in the different era. And uh, if we, uh, that we have shown, the referring principle, looking back at IZ, okay, looking back at IZ, we should uh, see this object evolving in time from Z equal eight to today. But the answer that we have made is that you cannot do the job uh, using LAT, Fermi, and uh, uh, because only one seal is left at IZ. But I think very challenging, very challenging, I'm just dreaming about, what the James Webb will allow to do to uncover that indeed the very early phases of the binary at IZ are the one which we cannot observe through the Jeff radiation support, but they can indeed be observed by James Webb and confirm the, all the binary nature that we are postulating in the early phases that I see. This is definitely very exciting. I would like to have a comment by Org on this. Yes, I think that study can be done because we can analyze that. We have um, uh, very nice proxies of the all emissions. So for for we can actually infer what uh, uh, can be our prospects for James Webb telescope. We can do that. It, it, it can, it, I don't think that's difficult, like in that. This is is, um, is in in our exp expertise to do that. I think we, we, sh we should we should do it. Actually, I have done this. I have done this, and uh, I'm doing with uh, Yelan. I have finished the half part for the spectroscopic part, and it seems for James Webb. Who is speaking? Who is speaking? Uh, Wang, Wang Yu. Wang Yu is speaking. Yes. Yeah. So for the photometric, we haven't done, but I think it will to a very, very high redshift. And for spectroscopic is uh, the upper limit is 2.5, redshift 2.5. I think we, I need to finish this work in this month. Well, yeah. I think, I think this just yeah. show one of the hottest topic that is going on in our group. We have said mm. enough to interest and to say that we don't want to not to disclose our work but mm. on the contrary, we, we have said the three impo very important contributions of ongoing work. The one that has just been summarized by Liang Li, the one uh, that has proposed Orge and is worth it to continue, continue, and also the ongoing work of um, Wang Yu. And by that time, this time, I think, uh, we can, these uh, are the three different approach going on contemporary in our group. And uh, let's go to the future and maybe we can have a, a break before, but uh, let's the chairman decide uh, before the contribution of, of, of Wang Liu. Yes. Um, go to, to Wang Liu and then to have the break. Uh, so, yes. Uh, we could uh, uh, decide among our, among all because 
the point is that we have one more talk until the coffee breaks, according to the program, which is one you now in the next uh, minutes. And then we have a, a huge break till lunch break. So either you prefer to take uh, one short break now, coffee break, because then we will have a free time after one you. Yes, and we, we come back maybe in 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then we have a di further discussion later. Okay. So we will meet in 15 minutes in, um, yes, uh, quarter to 11 and uh, to with one you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lian Li. Okay. Hello, everyone. I think we are back from the coffee break. And I will ask Wan Yu. Uh, yes. Hello, Charlie. Hi, Wan Yu. Nice to see you. <laughs> and nice to see you. Thank you. So, yeah, if you want to share your slides. So yeah, let me start. share my slides. Share my desktop. So it's okay. Yes, but it, it would be nice. You can put food. Yeah, in. I will. I will. Because first, I want to say something about the question that discussed in Leon's talk about the observation of James Webb for the supernova. Let me show one figure. Okay. To answer the question. Ah, this one. So this one, the, the x-axis is the wavelength. So this is 10 to 4, 10 to 4, more than 10 to 4 is in, in the infrared. Yeah, so most part is in the infrared and x-axis is the flux density. And the, this gray dots, triangle, square, diamond is the limit of different satellite. So it's marked here, Gemini, James Webb. So Genweb has the best uh, resolution around uh, 10 to minus eight. And each these uh, colorful ones, the green and the blue, the green is the optical part and the blue is the almost infrared part in the rest of frame. So at a different redshift. And this line, I take the supernova 1998BW as the example. So it's a solid line and the shadow is the lower limit and upper limit of all the JP associated supernova. So the range of the supernova luminosity. So you can see at the redshift two, the third one from up to bottom, at the redshift two, it's in the James Webb's uh, limit, it's, uh, they overlap. And at the redshift 2.5, only the brightest uh, supernova Supernova can be observed by James Webb, but this is a spectroscopic. So for photometric, we can have a deep distance. And for spectroscopic, uh, you, we have to see each line, but for photometric, we do the integration. So the redshift will be much higher. Okay, now I go back to my talk. Hmm? So you can, when you have shown, you can explain then at least one, one, one digit in redshift from the, from the previous uh, expectation. Uh, yes, before for the optical, we can only observe the redshift less than 1.2 or one. I think the furthest the supernova ever observed is two point something, and only two, I think more than redshift two. And people are looking for, the high redshift supernova, but the JRB associated ones are the best ones because we know its location, it's bright. We know the location, we know the time. So the space time coordinate is fixed and we don't need uh, a lot of telescopes time to, uh, to do a survey to look for it. Nice. Yeah. So I'm how to minimize. So I'm going to give a talk on the JRB 1908 
a showcase of binary related evolution. So this is uh, where we have the model BTHM model and the BTHM model has a lot of subclasses and this is one of the subclasses. So this chart B1908 29A is the uh, fourth closest camera first to data. It's red shift is uh, 0 0.08, like, so it's less than 0 0.1. So it's very close by. And this chart because it's very close by, and it, so it went underwent one of the most extensive observation campaign. So including the Fermi, the Swift, the KBV and MAP observation, and then a lot of satellite and the telescopes uh, like the GTC and the ground for the optical and infrared observation. And especially the HES, the very high energy HES, uh, observed the TEV on high energy photons. And this figure shows the pump observation observed by Fermi GBM. So the light curve shows two pulses. The first pulse starts to, to rise at uh, minus one second, the peaks, peaks at one second, and the fades at eight seconds. So in total, like uh, nine seconds. Then after a time gap, about 40 seconds, the second pulse rises. And this second pulse has a duration like a double of the first pulse, and it is a more, it has more photons. So how many more? Like five times more photons. So we do the first do the spectral fitting of these two pulses, and we did the, the by the Bayesian analysis with the Markov chain and the Carlo, and also we double checked by. Uh, implementing the Fermi GBN data tools. So the for the first pulse, the cutoff power function gives a best fit of the power and the band function and others. And we also tested uh, an additional black body component to our model, but it did not lead to a statistical improvement. So the fit of the spectra, uh, the power index is uh, uh, minus 1.15, so it's a very typical value, and the peak energy 144 kb for the first pulse. <laughs> the energy, integrated isotropic energy is like five times 10 to 49 Earth, so very low energy, and the luminosity divided by this 10 seconds, it's in the order of 10 to 48 Earth per second. And the second pulse is best uh, fitted by a band function, by a very strong band function. So you see it has a, a bump around the 10 kV. So this band function gives a very low peak energy at 13.58 kV, very low. This almost uh, touches the lower edge of the Fermi GB and the energy band. And because of a small amount of data energy before lower than this EP, lower than 13 kV. The low energy index is not a well constrained. In fact, here I wrote 0 0.5, actually it's 0 0.5 plus minus one. So it's a very, it's not constrained. But the high energy index beta equal to minus 1.53, this is a typical value. And the total energy, in the second pulse is uh, 2.5 times 10 to 50 Earth, and the average luminosity is about 2 times 10 to 49 Earth per second. So we can see though the second pulse is more energetic. Sorry. You want? Can you, can you speak a little bit uh, louder, please? Maybe uh, oh, I speak a, bit louder, yes. a, a bit louder. Thank you. So the, so though the second pulse uh, contains more photons and more energetic, but the average photon energy in the second pulse is lower than the first one. Because the first one peak energy is 144, and the second one is only 40, or only 14. So now go to the next one. 
Now this is a light curve, a full light curve, including the data from half. We can see in the middle only five yellow points from 24 seconds. And the energy there from 200 GeV and TO40 GeV. Can you indicate with the narrow the points? Uh, I cannot. I think it doesn't show my show my mouse, so I can only speak by words. So you see the has has is yellow, yellow cross in the middle from ten to four second to ten to five second, only five points. Okay, and the. Fermi GBN, Fermi GBN is you can see from the very beginning, uh, the orange dots, the orange dots very from very beginning, and the energy from ten to one thousand kV I plotted, and for the BAT, BAT is this uh, triangle also from the beginning, this triangle and with the arrow bar. So you can see the BAT is almost overlap with the GBN. They, they, though they have different uh, uh, energy band, but the, the shape should be similar and actually they are similar. And for the optical is the green one. The green, the green one from 10 to 4 seconds, you can see the observation of I band from GTC. Though there are some red points, the red points are extracted from the green one because using the green one, then minus the optical from the synchrotron. Then we have this red one. This red one is the supernova component. And then in the very in the below, we can see the uh, also the blue, also the blue one, the longest one. Blue is the X-ray. So we can see the X-ray is parallel to the uh, to the has. Also, it's almost parallel to the optical. So optical. High end, very high energy, and X ray, uh, they are like the light curves are almost parallel. Also for the uh, amila, for the radio, so it's parallel also. Now this kind of light curve, uh, the shape of light curve, is almost uh, typical. Though we can, though this, uh, we can see a small rebrightening at like ten to two to 23 seconds of brightening. This has been seen in some GRBs, but not frequent. Uh, right. And because uh, it's very wide range of the radio, optical, X-ray, very high energy observation, especially this high energy observation by Hess, this GRB has become a very essential source to examine a variety of models. So here I list some papers. So this first one by Abdallah, I taught, they presented the has observation of the very high energy photons. And uh, they also, they talked about the shape of the light curve is similar to others. And they also talked about the standard Photoshop model was they are applied to the optical and it showed its difficulties in explaining they are observation, the high energy observation. And then the second paper by Rosetta shows the radio observation, what is explained by with the synchrotron Photoshop model. Then Hu et al. presented to the optical observation and they analyzed the material length data and compared with the GRB 18028A. And the Fraja et al. modeled the optical and X-ray observation in the optical by the synchrotron for the model for Photoshop model and the, the board, they, uh, they modeled the very high energy observation by the synchrotron self confidence category. The Zhang et al. interpreted the very high energy observation by the external inverse confidence scenario with the seed photons coming from the prompt emission process. And this is Chang et al. They analyzed the very various episodes of this burst and they concluded that that is a short wave break model could not explain the entire burst. And Seto et al. proposed that this burst was viewed from an off-axis angle. Then Zhang et al. they proposed uh, that the interaction of the hard x photons in the first prompt pulse with the dusty medium produced the produced the second prompt pulse. 
and also the very high energy is uh, produced by the synchrotron self content. And the chair uh, focused on the early afterglow. Their multi wavelength study supported the existence of both forward and reverse shocks. So, when so all the above articles, they present uh, detailed observations, including the radio optical x ray very high energy, and it gives a variety of interpretations of different emission episodes. But uh, they all generally assume a single progenitor and unrelativistic shock wave. Also, we know the conventional con concept of primary burst uh, postulates that uh, the fiber model postulates that the when a core of a single massive star collapse, a relativistic shock like outflow forms and precipitation. The internal shocking outflow produces a prompt emission, then outflow interacts with the interstellar media, generating afterglow via the synchrotron process, as well as the very high energy emission via the synchrotron self constant process. So, for our approach, we have a very different approach. We started by focusing on the nature of the binary project. And far from describing a single leading on relativistic process, we emphasize the existence of a number of episodes with different emission processes. So we evidence first that this two, for this GRB, the two prompt pulses observed related to the progenitor of the binary components. Second, uh, the synchrotron electromagnetic radiation is from the mild uh, relativistic expanding supernova ejector. So instead of this uh, anti-relativistic uh, jet. And uh, also we have an assert the we finally address the appearance of optical supernova because uh, in our model, we have a supernova explosion, so it's very natural to have a supernova. So therefore, in our approach, we model the sequence of the physical and the related radiation process and the focus on individuating the binary properties that play the relevant roles. So in short, we are not using a single shock wave, but uh, with uh, the physicals in different episodes. You know, uh, Jorge gave a very complete uh, review of the simulation and the model of this binary system, that the evolution of the binary system. And here, this uh, GRB explained that by, also we have the same initial state that a neutron star and a CO core. But for these two stars, they, their separation is uh, uh, relatively far away in our uh, scenario. It's more than 10 to 12 centimeters. So in this sense, the equation from the supernova ejector, but first we have two stars, then one star explodes to have a supernova. The supernova ejector will be equated onto the companion neutron star. But with this very large separation, the new neutron, the, the, the neutron star companion cannot equate in one mass to collapse to a black hole. So finally, we have a new neutron star and a massive uh, neutron star. So usually, at the uh, for, for the supernova explosion, that the most of energy. Uh, like 10 to 53 of energy is deposited in the neutrino and a few percent of energy go to a kinetic energy of kinetic energy of supernova ejector about 10 to 41 to 10 to 42 usually and for the job is such a supernova always like 10 to 42 in order of 10 to 42 and this ejector expands outward at a velocity of 0.1 c averagely as the lower density outermost layer has a higher velocity. Uh, and while the inner side, they expand with a lower velocity. So at a few, after a few minutes, uh, 
So this expansion. So I'm talking about this picture, the simulation done by Lola. So the this is an ongoing process. So in so we can see the supernova has been exploded and the supernova eject has reached the companion neutron star on the right side. So first uh, we have this matter accretion onto the companion companion neutron star, the green dots uh, surrounded by the uh, red color. And this accretion produces the first pulse, the first pulse on the top left. But in the meanwhile, there are some matter falls back into an accretion process on to the new neutron star. So the, the blue part. This fallback accretion is significantly amplified by this companion neutron star. You know, it alters the companion neutron star alters the trajectory that a, a partial of the supernova ejector it flows back to the new neutron star. And this accretion rate on to the companion neutron star is about as a 10 to minus three solar mass per second. And also the this fall back onto the a new neutron star almost in the same scale, I think. And uh, but it only lasts for a few some tens of seconds because for this high accretion rate it should be supplied by the very high density and a slow moving part of a supernova ejector. At uh, this time, how long the accretion takes and how long the observation we will observe, it depends on the separation by separation a lot. And uh, with this very high accretion rate, the energy release will be like 10 to 48 to 10 to 49 of per second. This is what, so the time scale and the energy is exactly what we observed. Also, I want to say, we also Jorge explained in his presentation that is the accretion onto the new neutron star actually has two components. The first is the, the typical fallback matter, fallback accretion, the same as a single star. You know, after it bursts, it has this accretion, fallback accretion. But this accretion, Rate is small, small, and the peak luminosity is less than 10 to 48 per second. So it can hardly to be seen for this uh, cosmological distance. So only the because of this binarity, because of this uh, disruptor or uh, this by the companion, or uh, this fallback matter induced by the companion neutral star, it induces a high accretion rate. Then we can see, then we can have a higher luminosity till 10 to 49 of a second than to be seen. So this is a characteristic of only for the binary model. So, from the simulation, the short time separation about 40 seconds between the two pods suggests that a binary period of the order of tens of minutes, as uh, this is in agreement with the energy release in the point of emission of these two pods. For an opto period of like 20 to 40 minutes, the peak accretion rate will be like uh, 10 to minus four solar mass per second. So this uh, transfers into the accretion power of 10 to 49 per second, assuming 10% of efficiency. Uh, and for the energy release power, the rotational energy of the neutron star, which first is spinned up by the accretion. For example, a 1.5 solar mass star and a, with accretion rate 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 5 solar mass per second, it implies the spin up rate is about 40 hertz per minute. So this simulation shows the uh, neutron star accretion and as the simulation, the neutron star accretion peaks in about the one tenth of the optical period. So the neutron star finally will have a frequency about 80 to 100 to 160 Hertz. This implies the rotation power 
of the neutron star is uh, like two to five times times 10 to 48 Earth per second. So here we can see that the accretion. So we have energy directed from accretion, and also we have the energy released by the neutron, neutron star. The neutron star will spin down there. It has a very fast rotating that releases its rotation energy. These two energy, they are quite similar. Um, and uh, so here we can, uh, let's have a short conclusion that the first spike, the first pulse is produced by the accretion onto the companion neutron star. Then the second one is accretion onto the new neutron star. The fallback accretion of the new neutron star. And this fallback accretion will continue as a source of energy that powers up the glow. So as well as the spin down of the new neutron star. The afterglow is produced by the mild delay relativistic expansion of the system ejector in the presence of the magnetic field of the new neutron star. And we know this synchrotron model is widely adopted in the JAD physics. So we also adopt it for the afterglow, but with some different specifications. So first, we assume the eject expands at a constant velocity, at a low velocity, 0.1c, or around the fast part of slow, around 0.1c. So the radio evolution evolves as a linear movement, and the traditional model always considers an ultra-relative shock wave, which has a very, very fast velocity than ours. So another second is our magnetic field is from the new neutron star. In agreement with the Porter theory, we assume that uh, at a larger distance from the new neutron star beyond its light cylinder, the magnetic field decreases linearly with distance. And this implies that the magnetic field strength felt by the expanding eject evolves with time as the formula, this B formula. So we have a uh, Changing D, not as not a constant D, or not as well, the traditional model always assume that a given percentage of the kinetic energy, like a 0.1 percent, uh, will be converted to a magnetic field. And many of the simulations always consider a constant B, but here we have a evolution B. And a third that we have the fallback accretion, we have energy injection that we have from the fallback accretion of the new neutron star. So as this formula, L injector. And then also we have the energy injection from the spin down of the new neutron star. This energy injection will dominate the late time evolution like more than 24 seconds. And now we consider the dipole and the quadrupole Two components here we know for a newborn neutron star it may have the quadruple components and a strong one so this is a fitting so our fitting shows that a, a new neutron star spinning at eight millisecond period and with a dipole field of 10, five times 10 to 12 gauss and a quadruple field like 10 to 14 gauss. And also the velocity of the super eject moves at the uh, order of 10 to 9 centimeter per second uh, can generate and can well fit the observation. We have these six lines are our uh, numerical results and the points are the observation. So we fit the X-ray, we fit the blue one is optical, but not the the blue bump is the supernova, it's another story. And then we also fit the, here we show two bands of the radio. And this burst has a very high energy emission. And for our previous the synchrotron fitting, we cannot produce it. So synchrotron fitting is the black line on the left side. So also we tried to apply the inverse Compton in our model. So 
that the upper carrying of the inverse Compton increases the energy of the photons by a factor that it comes to the square of the electrons Lorentz factor. Therefore, the spectra on the right side, they, it has a similar shape, shape of the similar shape of the synchrotron spectrum on the right, left side. But still, the synchrotron self confidence emission cannot explain the head observation because we can see it peaks at a few hundreds of MeV and the cutters at uh, less than 10 GeV and the luminosity is much lower than the head has. Uh, therefore, we concluded that, that neither the synchrotron emission nor the SSC can explain the very high energy emission of this burst within our model of the emission from the supernova ejector. But because the similar power law behavior of this very high energy and the X-ray light curve, this suggests that the very high energy could be related to some transient activity of the new neutron star. But at this moment, we have not explored this possibility in detail. We also notice that the Hess team in their paper, they expressed a similar conclusion that the traditional optical glow model, including SSC, does not explain the observation. And they expected a multi zoom emission model because we are using a multi zoom emission model. And not, we haven't developed it for this high energy emission. And our this BDH model naturally contains a supernova. We know it. And the supernova produced like 0.4 solar mass nickel. Its radioactive decay energy is emitted uh, mainly at the optical wavelengths with a corresponding flux that peaks around 13 days in the southwest of France. So here we can see this red part is the finally conferred supernova by GTC at 10 to 67 hertz, very low redshift, so almost uh, 13 days. Okay. So here we conclude uh, that the first GRB 1908-29A is a close distance of redshift uh, 0.0785 was observed by multi-band telescopes and satellites on the ground and in space. This detailed observation is heaven have given us the opportunity to find the emission that corresponds to the episodes expected to occur in our BDH2 model. And second, the initial X-ray pulse of energy four times 10 to 49 arc, and the second pulse of energy five times, or three times 10 to 50 arc represent the supernova eject accretion onto the companion neutron star and the new neutron star. Third, we explained the radio optical and X-ray optical glow emissions as due to the synchrotron radiation from the neutron star ejector expanding in the magnetic field of new neutron star. The new neutron star continuously inject energy into a supernova ejector from fallback creation and the spin down only to the magnetic breaking. From the fitting of the optical glow synchrotron emission, we infer the new neutron star spinning at 8 millisecond period with a dipole field of 5 times 10 to 12 Gauss. Okay, so I finished. Okay, uh, thank you, Wan Yu, for mm -hmm. your talk. And uh, we have uh, a, some 10 minutes time for questions and, and comments. So let's so if see. I can, yes, Maria, can please. Yes. Can... Uh, so um, thank you for your uh, very nice talk. And I have some comments uh, in relation to the review that you were mentioning in the literature about uh, several papers that were uh, discussing the very yeah. high energy emission. I want to point out, yes, I wanted to point out that there are also uh, there is also another paper of mm -hmm. Fray et al. 2022 that we recently posted in in archive, in which yeah. we analyzed the uh, observation uh, from Fermilat, 
GRBs, mm -hmm. and we use the uh, synchrotron self Compton. So um, I think you may want to have a look at this uh, oh. and also the results because we, we did uh, um, a statistical analysis for the full sample of uh, the Fermilat GRBs. Oh, and another, another that I want to, to run is that um, uh, for a few cases of mm -hmm. GRBs that are observed by Fermilat, actually there are three, three cases, 09902B, uh, 160509 and 090510. Uh, this, they have indication also of the plateau emission and we studied in a paper in which I'm first author uh, in 2021, the, um, uh, the uh, external formula shock. So I think this is uh, useful probably for you yeah, to, it's, to it's have a look. I will, I will take a look at those yes. papers. Thank you, thank you. Um, you're welcome. Okay, thank you, Maria. So we have time for more questions. May I have some uh, um, question, uh, yes, Carlos? Okay. Yes, please. Yes, about this comment uh, of Maria Giovanna. Um, so this new paper that you mentioned with uh, Nisim, that of 2022. Um, yes. So uh, you include also 1908-29-8 there. I mean, I'm um, interested to know if you managed to explain um, the TV emission with synchrotron self quantum for that source. Uh, on that paper, not, but we are working on another paper. And uh, uh, hopefully, you know, we can tell you a little bit more in, uh, you know, uh, a month or so. But okay. thank you for your question, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Let's see, we have, there is another question or comment in the audience. We don't see any right hands. Yes, actually, I would like to comment uh, on the um, first uh, uh, slide also, or when you, um, about the, the um, James Webb telescope uh, stuff, um, just to um, tell, uh, to want you not to focus only on the supernova, but also on the optical um, counterpart of the afterglow, of the synchrotron afterglow, um, that uh, we know can be uh, at a higher lumin, can be more luminous than the supernova itself. Um, and so that could be pretty well observed up to higher ratio for yeah, is with telescope. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, thank you. We, we are considering this, thank you. Um, okay, I have a general question. Maybe if mm. there is not, uh, let's see, there is no right hand. No, there is no. So um, I have a general question. I don't know if it's directly mm. related to, to this talk of you, you want, but maybe for general mm. modelistic. Do you have some estimate, uh, let's say in, in, the, in, the, in the cases where you expect very tight uh, orbits in this binary driven hypernova model, do you do you have an expectation of the gravitational wave emission uh, in in terms also of the of the mm -hmm. potential observational capabilities today that you can check these these scenarios? I think we have a paper. I think Hawke has has a paper dedicating to the gravitational wave of this yes. this model. Uh, I see. It was uh, already mentioned by Jorge this morning. And uh, that is the only reference that we uh, consider um, of great interest. But uh, let me congratulate <clears throat> Wang Yu mm. also for the presentation, because uh, uh, it helps to give uh, all the numerical value uh, which are, uh, have, have been used, the masses, the spin and all these uh, characteristics which characterize our model in a summary to explain also the uniqueness uh, of the role of the different component, namely the supernova event, the mass uh, of the companion uh, neutron star, the mass uh, of the new neutron star, and uh, the spin and all this quantity which makes uh, 
the system testable. And I think this is very worthwhile, maybe to summarize while we present the, uh, with the help of your uh, new slides, when we present this case in explaining the relation between uh, the supernova and uh, this observation and the uniqueness of the supernova luminosity and uh, the time of occurrence. And the same thing should be done for 1901-14C with uh, uh, Raim and co-worker. Lots of, of new work, which uh, is uh, uh, absolutely necessary to uh, explain better the difference of this model from the single object with the ultra relativistic jet. There is no ultra relativistic jet and there is not a single object to start with. Many objects and the, the fundamental role of synchrotron, but not synchrotron in a ultra relativistic jet, but synchrotron from a spinning new neutron star. This uh, I think is, are the crucial point which we have to emphasize. Okay, thank you for this comment. And uh, we have time for uh, some more question. I would like to make a comment, if possible, about this thing. Um, uh, to inform you that uh, with Laura, we actually uh, managed to produce some um, analytic feeds of the uh, of the accretion rate, not only on the fallback accretion to the newborn neutron star, but also to the neutron star companion um, as a function of the orbital periods. Um, I think that will, will really uh, help a lot in the analysis of the system because we will uh, very likely manage to to make an analytic analytic description of the evolution of both the stars in the in the, in the first moments. So we are working on that with Daura. So we started with the uh, analytic accretion rates, um, and from that we will um, we are attempting to some uh, analytic description of the new neutron star and the neutron star companion evolution within uh, mass uh, uh, angular momentum and the, 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 the ratio of critical mass. So uh, that's it's coming, I hope, uh, very soon. Thank you. Good news, very good news. Very good. Uh, okay, so if we, there are no more questions, I have a general comment. Uh, we expect to have uh, now uh, a huge break until lunch break. And then in the afternoon session, the idea is to start uh, uh, one slot uh, after the, the 3 p.m., which is the, supposed to be the first uh, slot for the afternoon session. So uh, we shall start at 3.45 with the talk of uh, Chris Breyer and then the, the conclusions of the of the meeting. Um, so, well, I hope to see you again in the afternoon session. Oh, uh, no, we have a, ah, yes, for this, uh, not right hands, but applause. So, okay, uh, thanks a lot to Wanju again. Thank you and uh, all, to all the speakers of this morning session and uh, yes see you after lunch break at 3:45 thank you bye, bye.